Thanks, Ben, for kicking us off. Um, great. Well, let's get started. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here today for um, our fifth healthy conversation. What does COP27 mean for our health? My name is Remy Shergel. I'm the, the uh, Campaigns and Communications Manager at the Climate and Health Alliance. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am calling in from Wurundjeri country today of the Kulin Nations in Nam or so-called Melbourne. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to the country that you're calling in from today. Um, this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty here has never been ceded. Uh, at the Climate and Health Alliance, we commit to listening to and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and organisations about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing uh, in our work. Um, just before we, I introduce you to our really excellent speakers, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we really encourage you to update your Zoom name if you haven't, feel free to put your name, uh, your preferred pronouns, and if you feel comfortable the country that you're on, um, and feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box as many of you are already doing. Um, keep yourself on mute. We will have an opportunity for questions at the end, so keep them coming in the chat box and we will do our best to get to all of them. Um, this session is being recorded and it's gonna be made available after the event. Uh, so without further ado, um, we're going to pass to our speakers, uh, and I think people often do a better job of introducing themselves. So um, I'm going to speak to each of our, uh, pass to all of our three speakers, and they're going to introduce themselves, um, how they fit into the international climate and health community, and uh, maybe just tell us a little bit of a memorable moment that happened at, at COP whether you were there or whether you are, if you, whether you were following it uh, from afar. Um, I'll pass to Arthur first. Hi, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Arthur uh, Wins. I am Kaha's policy and approximate manager, uh, and I'm currently still calling from the Egyptian time zone, so it's quite early here. Uh, and apologies in advance if I'm not, um, uh, making much sense today. I'm still uh, suffering from COVID. I picked up COVID in the final days of um, COP, so I'm wondering if one of the other negotiators who got it, like John Kerry, gave it to me. I don't know. I think it's come around a bit. Um, so yeah, um, hi everyone. Um, a memorable moment from COP for me, um, I think, was the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion. So COPs are quite um, sterile environments often. There are just bright lights, aircon, um, lots of white walls, and people running around feeling like they're important and running around from event to event. Um, and I must say that um, I walked past the Indigenous Peoples for, um, Pavilion quite often just because it was next to the Health Pavilion. And often it just stopped me in my tracks because of the sounds that would come out of it. Uh, there was lots of singing there um or 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 just the colors that would uh, that people would have like their traditional gowns on um and it was just i don't know it, it struck me every time that i was just running around pretending to be busy or running from one event to another and i would just walk past this beautiful pavilion full of first nations people from around the world from I don't know, the high arctic to amazon people in full feather gowns to pacific island um, leaders and often it would just stop me dead in my tracks and i would sort of start listening in because they would be singing a song together or um, being grateful for certain things. And it was just so incredible. And I remember even at COP26 last year when I also went in, in Glasgow, the same happened. It just creates this atmosphere of people from across the world coming together and, and really being grounded in what they're fighting for. And, and just like last year, it really stopped me dead in my tracks and often gave, gave me goosebumps just to sort of listen in. Um, and yeah, I think that's one of the things that will stick with me because like I said, these COP venues often feel like they're not part of the regular world. They feel a bit detached and having people, First Nations people from all over the world in their traditional gowns there and really sort of grounding the conversation. I don't know, it's quite memorable for me, I think. So I think that's what will stick with me. Thank you, Arthur. That is um, great to hear. I went to COP25 and um, I'm really glad to hear that the presence of First Nations people around the world has has come up a big way since then. 
Um, I'm going to pass to Rashmi, um, if you could introduce yourself, what you do, and uh, yeah, a memorable moment from COP. Thanks, Remy. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, as Remy mentioned, my name is Rashmi Venkatraman. Um, I'm calling in now from Sydney, uh, otherwise known as Gadigal country of the Aro people, who I'd like to pay my respects to. Um, and my background, uh, being a classic latchkey kid growing up, my mum's a doctor, so I grew up in waiting rooms in hospitals and clinics. That's my entire life. Uh, basically kind of part, uh, paved my way into global public health. So I've worked in a lot of uh, non-for-profit um, organizations, um, mainly in the Asia Pacific region. I moved to the UK about five years ago and now have just recently moved back. So I've kind of worked a bit all over the place. Um, I kind of sit, I was just very fascinated uh, from a really young age about, you know, what happened to the patients before they entered my mom's clinic and after they left my mom's clinic. So given that as my basis, I've kind of worked in understanding global public health strategies, policies, how to plan and manage projects and programs. And at the moment, I work as an independent consultant in a bunch of different areas. Um, and I, I'm obsessed with it. So um, the more I can get of it, the better. Uh, and the second part of what you asked me. Um, Just a yeah, memorable moment from COP. A memorable moment. Um, so I was, I landed in Cairo uh, from Sydney. And so I was already feeling the effects of jet lag. So I was glad I had a few days in Cairo before I got to Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, I was staying in Giza and I was looking out over the balcony to this insane view of the pyramids. And I couldn't believe it. I'm looking at it. And the, there was a guide up there on this balcony and, and I was like, oh, can you tell me what, what am I looking, I understand, I know year seven history, I get it, but specifically what am I looking at? And he's like, you know, there's a great emperor Kofu, his son, his grandson, and I'm squinting and I was like, oh, what are they? And he's like, oh, those three little mold hills looking things. And he's like, yeah, I was like, yeah, what are they? And he's like, those are the Queens. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, good. Um, and then at that exact moment, I started getting all these tweets and messages and WhatsApp and Signal. Everything started blowing up on my phone of people who were at COP and they just had the leader summit. And there was this big picture of all the leaders at COP. And I found myself squinting at that photo to find the women while I was squinting in front of me to look at the women. And um, it made me want to laugh and cry and um <laughs> felt a wave of emotion so that is definitely a moment um I won't forget because it really set up the whole history of what we had fought for and had up against as well wow another really striking example <laughs> thanks Rashmi really appreciated that um I'll pass to Shweta Hello everyone, um, my name is Shweta Narayan and I'm the Global Climate and Health Campaigner with Healthcare Without Harm. I'm based out of India. I'm calling in from Kerala, where I live uh, in the hills here in a really pristine small village and uh, in some ways privileged to be here away from dust and noise and all the pollution that often we uh, associate India with. I mean, worst polluted place, um, in terms of air pollution. Um, my work uh, at Healthcare Without Harm is with um, uh, on campaigns and advocacy, especially uh, bringing together the health community and the health professionals in um, uh, being uh, strong advocates for climate and health within the sector, within the healthcare sector itself, and also outside the sector leading by example and transforming the way policies are made in support of communities and in support of the planet. Um, and um, for me, I, I did not attend the COP. And just for the record, I've never attended a COP except for COP 8, I think, which was in Delhi. And there's something that happened at that COP that like really made me think about it um, in not a good way. Uh, but uh, I have been following very keenly. I mean, this is part of what I do. This is part of my interest. And more importantly, like, as a citizen of this world, I have I have stakes in this. So I follow this quite closely. And my memorable moment, given that I was just tracking social media and mostly Twitter, and this is a time when Twitter is also blowing out, like in a different way and not a very good way. Um, so it was like really hard 
to follow up and making sure that I'm getting the right information and it's not disinformation. But it was somewhere uh, related to two images that I will always carry with me. The leaders leadership summit and that image was striking and there were a lot of memes around it. So definitely that. But what was really inspiring for me um, towards the end of COP when loss and damage funds were, uh, I mean, the, the whole announcement was made and the leadership, and there was this image of uh, Senator Sherry Rahman, um, uh, who, who is the president of uh, G77 plus China, who's really, really put herself out there, um, very strongly defending why we need this fund. That image of like that, she had this, she posted this image on her social media on Twitter, where there were these last minute like checks and she she's surrounded by women mostly and women leadership. And for me, that was, that was it. You know, you could have all those photo app, um, you know, ops with um, world leaders, but these are the true leaders who have fought and fought really hard to get us meaningful uh, rewards from this otherwise a really crazy moment. And uh, that was very encouraging. And that was my moment uh, for, for the call. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I get a bit emotional about COPs. I just think the gravity of the decisions that are made um, and I'm already like feeling emotional from your three examples. So we'll see how we go. Um, uh, so what we're going to attempt to do today is to help people understand what the decisions that come out of COP uh, mean for their health. Um, possibly potentially their own health, but also health globally. Um, and so uh, we, those who have been to COP and those who have followed COP uh, know that even when you're deep, when you understand the process quite well, it's really hard to interpret what the decisions actually mean. Um, so I'm really excited to hand over to Arthur and I really, I'm so grateful that he's joined us while he's not feeling his best. Um, but Arthur's going to sort of briefly explain the outcomes of COP, um, many of which were outlined in what's called the Sharm El Sheikh cover decision. Um, and a few other outcomes uh, sort of were decided as, as side deals. So Arthur, over to you. Uh, well, thank, thanks Remy. Uh, and, and sorry, I don't have any, any presentation or something. I think I'll, I'll try and keep it very brief. I just want to maybe make a few comments building on what Shweta just said. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have read analyses and there's quite a, a few analyses out there. So I think it's quite nice that we can just have a conversation about this together and, and maybe pick on, pick up on a few things uh, without giving a full overview. I think what Shweta just said, it really hones in on the, on the key point really is that um, this was quite a historic moment for the UFCCC. Um, and and it's, I, it's definitely worth celebrating that and celebrating leadership that got us there and um the plant minister of pakistan sherry Rehman, that you mentioned Shweda, is um was absolutely crucial there um so yeah I'll, I'll start with some of the wins of cop and I, I think the fact that all countries of the world agreed to create a loss and damage fund is really unprecedented um and i know there's a lot of sort of negative media around cop was a complete failure but just the fact that this happened i think is a very very important thing for us to celebrate um, and personally, I sort of take my cue from um, people who have most to lose and, and for example, island leaders, um, the Pakistan minister and, and other uh, vulnerable countries, they're celebrating this win. Uh, and it just strikes me that in a lot of the Western media, um, in Europe, US, Australia, COP is sort of portrayed as a failure. Um, but then if you look at what uh, island leaders, African nations, uh, a lot of countries in the Asia Pacific are saying COP was a big win for them. So I think it is important for us to listen to why that was a big win for them and, and how we can show more solidarity. Um, because it, it's quite interesting that during the COP, there was actually one of the key lessons for me was that there was quite an, an interesting dynamic. Usually there's a very strong divide between developed and developing countries' positions. And that was sort of broken a little bit this year where there was much more solidarity um, and, and also sort of, I don't know, a, a dialogue in finding a compromise to set up this loss and damage fi uh, fine fund. But it's just interesting that then that's not reflected in the media and the analysis now where there's suddenly again a very strong divide between, oh, well, there's a loss and damage fund, but we did not make progress on 1.5. And, and that is true. I think it is important to look at why we didn't make progress on 1.5. Um, so I, 
I don't know, in the analysis you might have read, you might have seen that we haven't actually progressed since the Glasgow Pact. Um, so I, the loss and damage fund was uh, came out, but um, we didn't make any progress on improving our NDCs, on finding ways to um, reduce emissions faster. Uh, and so we have a repeat of one of Glasgow, which was sort of keeping the 1.5 alive, barely. Uh, but we have a loss and damage fund now. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll I'll leave it at that and open it for Shredda and Rashmi's initial reflections because I'm I'm a bit foggy. Sorry. That's okay. Thanks, Arthur. Um, just before I go to Rashmi Shredda, I'll just um clarify and and all good. I know you're a little bit foggy. Just um NDCs stands for nationally determined contributions. I believe getting it. Yep, I'm getting a nod, um, which is the commitments that each individual country brings to COP. Um, and that sort of goes into the accounting to work out how close we are to actually meeting that globally agreed aim of 1.5 degrees. Um, many of those countries didn't come with an updated uh, NDC this year, meaning that unfortunately uh, we're still on track for, for well above um, 1.5. And we will talk a little bit about uh, fossil fuels later in the chat. Uh, which has a bit to do with why uh, with that particular problem. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned the loss and damage fund. Um, I'd love reflections from Rashmi and Shweta, uh, if you could maybe go a little bit into the loss and damage fund and, and what that means uh, for, for people all over the world. Uh, I might start with Rashmi. Yeah, sure. Um, and just to kind of uh, follow on from what Arthur said, we also need to remember that this these processes, without them, we would be much further behind than we actually realize. So I think sometimes when you're in the thick of it, we forget how important COPs actually are. But without them, we would be way worse off. Um, so I had to remind myself of that a multitude of different times during the, the event. Um, the loss and damage fund was as Arthur said, a big win. Um, along with that, you know, we had the Santiago Network, a little bit of progress made on that. The Go Global Shield um, was also launched at COP. Um, the other pretty hilarious thing that happened was I bumped into John Kerry so many times and I had no idea why. <laughs> he was everywhere. Um, and despite, you know, some of the pledges being minuscule into what we actually need, um, it's a bold step forward is something that countries have been fighting for for decades. Um, and so I think it's one of those th things where we can't really say, oh, we had this, but we can't have that. I have to believe in my most hopeful mindset that we're capable of doing both, um, setting this up for something that's been fought for, but at the same time, um, also pushing that ambition forward as well. I think the, um, the we the momentum kind of built up at the beginning of COP when it was on the agenda. People already saw it as a big win. And the fact that it was established uh, as a fund, you know, there was going to be something there. Um, I should also mention, just following on from what I said about women, actually women were at the forefront of those negotiations at COP. And so that made me feel very, very hopeful and proud. Um, yeah, I might hand it over to Shweta. Thanks, thanks, Ashminata. And I mean, just just to build on the loss and damage fund because that's that's something, um, as mentioned, is historic that has happened, and this has been uh, a demand from um, island nations, vulnerable states, and developing countries for the last thirty years, and the civil society, and since the Rio uh, Earth Summit. And um, the reason why it is important and historic is, first of all, it it. It is an acknowledgement by the rich countries. And I mean, even though the in, in the civil society space, there was coming together of the global north and global south, in the negotiation space, there was a clear divide between the rich country, the global north and the global south. There were a lot of attempts made, and we'll talk about that when we're talking about uh, what was uh, scary or what was not very happy that happened at COP. But there were attempts made to do away with some of the agreements of on equity on on common but differentiated uh, uh, responsibilities so those were issues but this moment of uh, a loss and damage fund and why it's important is six weeks before the cop there's an interview of uh, john kerry where he said it's not possible forget about it right and on the day on the first day it's on agenda 
and on the final day it's been you know approved and it's been it's been uh, supported and uh, and uh, it, it just shows that public pressure civil society coalition and solidarity and political will where people are willing to put put out their courageous and bold measures works and 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 not just for this fund sake because there are a lot of I mean, the devil is in the details. So we still don't know how it's going to be managed and how it's going to be operated. But it's, it's, it's that moment of recognition of all of these efforts and the solidarity that has been bent. It, it, I, it has taken 30 years. I would have wanted it to take less. But it, 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 is a, it is a point of success. And it's a historic reminder for us that solidarity works, public pressure works, and we need to continue and we need to up those pressure if we really are concerned about our shared fate, which we all should be concerned about. So in that, and, and it's, 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 a, it's an acknowledgement that there, is, there has been a, a damage done, there will be damage done, and people need funds to re rebuild, cope with those disasters, and, and live a life with dignity. So I think for, for all these issues, the loss and damage fund becomes historical. I'm cautiously opti optimistic because as I said, the, the the details would matter and we'll see i mean but but we will hold our leaders accountable so we i'm i'm positive that something good will come out of it soon yeah just quickly like to build on that i think that was really on point shweta and to me it also points out that we are in a new time really in a new age we're in the age of loss and damage already um and that was clear with the floods in pakistan and coincidentally, Pakistan was sort of the, like you said, the, one of the countries that was leading this big group of developing uh, countries, a big block of countries, 130. But that was also clear with, like, it was big floods in Nigeria before. And it was interesting to see new players step into these negotiations as well. For example, the Red Cross has become very active and Doctors Without Borders as well. So these two really big humanitarian organizations realize this is where the game is at now. We need to understand how we continue what we do as humanitarian organizations in the age of climate change so it, that just to me showed we are in a in the loss and damage age now and one thing that uh, the uh, president of the red cross told me really struck me while cop was going on for two weeks the red cross had to respond to about a half a dozen climate disasters across africa and asia as well and they said uh, about 2500 people um died either through floods or um, specific events that they responded to that were related to climate change in those in that two-week period so to me that, that really struck me that like we're we're just in the age of loss and damage and it's only appropriate that COP also tries to respond to that properly uh, and it sort of rebalances the fact that I mean the Paris Agreement was always supposed to be having these three pillars mitigation adaptation but also loss and damage and loss and damage has always been a bit on the side and it, i think this cop helps to redress that balance now and and uh, another thing that doctors without borders um told me was well what we can't mitigate too what we don't adapt to will be suffered and when it's suffered humanitarian actors like doctors without borders and red cross will have to respond to it um and, and we need to figure out how to respond to it and that's what countries were trying to figure out a cop as well just, yeah, go Shrana. Yeah. Remy, just just quick thing, and again, because I was just monitoring everything on social media, something that I really liked, and it made so much sense, it was smart and witty, was the message on Pakistan Pavilion, which said, what happens in Pakistan does not stay in Pakistan. And I think that, that again, was that one moment, which kind of makes you realize it's, it's our fate. I mean, it's happened there first, but it could happen to us anytime. Yeah, it feels, I mean, even I went in 2019 um, to COP25 and the thing I found most disturbing about COP was Australia, that was Australia's sort of uh, mega, mega fire season and it was pretty horrifying. But when I was at the conference, it really, I didn't feel its presence there and I found that quite disturbing. So I think even in the, in the three years since, it sounds like this, the, feeling that climate change and the loss and damage from it is happening now is really starting to permeate the conference, which um, is completely necessary. Um, 
there I'm just, it's really great to hear about some of the great things that I, that some of the good things that happened at COP and there's actually a couple more that I don't want people to to miss um do, does anyone the a couple of the other wins um were around the text to a clean healthy and sustainable environment making it in um, which is really exciting, a new UN sort of legal right. I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but um, some good steps forward on food and uh, finance reform and youth uh, engagement. Um, and also definitely a step up in sort of the health community, their role being recognised. Um, I might just do another quick round of the panel just for any comments on any of, of those wins that you'd like to share. Um, I'll start with Rashmi. Yeah, um, it was incredible because this text, when it came out in draft, was so long. It's probably the longest I've ever seen it. Um, and so we were quite nervous, I think, in the lead up to what was going to get cut, what was going to get kept. Um, so the fact that that phrase made it in is, is a win. Um, but again, like Shweta said, the, the devil is in the details. It's how it's going to show up later. Um, the other big win was definitely around uh, agriculture and food. Um, there was a lot of debate around um, that the Coronavia um, joint agreement that came out, but also in terms of um, the phrase food systems and water security, those words being included, but whole of the food systems. Again, that's where I think the health sector really will connect with that um, piece of work as well. Um, it was quite amazing to see the presence of agriculture at this year's COP as well. Um, there was a lot there and there was quite a push for it. So I think in terms of um, the fact that uh, a big win, in my opinion, even though there were a few things that were missing that were quite integral, was the fact that this entire process around agriculture was very inclusive. Um, it's been a long process. Um, so I think that was something else that um, was was really interesting to see. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't seen as a business as usual type um, of dialogue. It was very much um, we're in the thick of it. So that that is something that I took away from those um, conversations and watching that process take place. Um, the yes, yeah, so I might if you guys had anything else to add on. The agreement before I change the topic. <laughs> Arthur, would you like to go or? No, go, go, Shada, sorry. <laughs> so I, I just feel, um, a, a, yes, uh, there was a greater recognition in the sense of the role of young people, role of youth. Uh, there was uh, definitely that win um, uh, of adding the right to clean and healthy environment in the preamble or I, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know where exactly, but the fact that it, it just made it into the text is is again, and I mean, some of it is maybe symbolic at this point, but I mean, I think the task for us coming out of this uh, meeting is that how do we actualize this? How do we make it actually real and not mere words in, in these, you know, reams of paper that would be printed and would soon be forgotten? Um, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm not an, an, an financial expert, but whatever I've been reading, the, the message to reform multilateral uh, investment banks and, and, and that uh, with countries uh, pushing hard. And I, I'm not sure if it, if it made to the final text, but it was really, really a prominent point of discussion to um, uh, you know, encourage uh, lending agencies uh, to, uh, you know, um, uh, in terms of uh, make climate-based investments and de-risking investments and uh, making capital affordable. In, and, and this could perhaps go a long way in um, um, unlocking finance uh, for uh, developing countries. I think that, uh, and, and also the fact that, uh, and reflect, reflecting back to what Arthur said, that in this moment, these the devastation is being unleashed while we are at these meetings and while we are at all, all these conferences deciding what the future looks like. And most vulnerable countries are already overburdened with their failing economies, increasing inflation, uh, energy prices, food prices. And with this devastation that is being unleashed are further 
um, you know, uh, their, their capacity is compromised and they need funds, they need investment apart from the committed funds that the rich nations did not, I mean, there was not much clarity about it, but I think the role of multilateral um, uh, investment banks and financing in, in financial institutions become really, really critical and a shared voice for the first time really emphasizes on that. So I think um, in a lot of sense, um, just to reflect uh, before the COP started, I think there was a message from Egypt that this COP is about showing the money. And uh, a lot of the money has not been shown, but some of the progress has been sort of historic in terms of the future of seeing that money. So I think that that would be, uh, that would be interesting to see how we follow. And again, how we uh, hold our leaders accountable. Yeah, also, I, I fully agree, uh, but maybe just slightly push back on um, what you said, Shweta, around the, the right to clean, healthy, sustainable environment. Of course, we're we're just sort of adding a few words to uh, a text, and, and, and this, in this case, it was called the, the cover decision, which is sort of the, the political text that sits on top of the negotiated text. Um, but I think in this particular case, a few words do make a, a world of difference, just because we are talking about a legal document here. It is actually a legal text in the same way that the Paris Agreement is a, a legal internationally negotiated text. So the fact that the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment, which is a right that has been adopted by the UN General Assembly only a couple of months ago at the UNGA in, in September, was included, actually does provide a very, very strong legal hook. So you could say if we just add the word health somewhere, maybe it doesn't have many implications, but the fact that we actually added the right and it's an actually resolution that, that was adopted by the UN General Assembly does have implications. In, personally, I'm not exactly sure what those implications will be, um, but there definitely will be legal implications and um, potentially also stronger cases to be made in litigation cases going forward as well, which is becoming increasingly a thing as well, um, where governments are being um, sued for not um, not adhering to things that they've agreed to at uh, legal at the international platforms like the COP. So in that sense, I think it is a very big win. Uh, and like um, Rashmi said, actually it was included in the first draft, then it disappeared uh, in new iteration. So the Egyptian presidency had removed it. And there was a massive pushback from health groups, including uh, Kaha Health, Healthcare Without Harm, the Global Climate Health Alliance, and also our human rights uh, organization allies. So it's quite a win in terms of how we mobilized in the second week of COP to get that back in. We spoke to a lot of government directly, a lot of delegations to make sure that they pushed to get that right back in because it was something that we knew most countries had already agreed to at the UN General Assembly. So in that sense, it, it's really also a win for us to mo in the way that we mobilized during COP to get that right in. We really fought for that right to be in there. And so in a way, we should really celebrate our wins here and, and be happy that that's there. Um, on food, I also agree with Rashmi that um, it's become quite an inclusive uh, discussion. Initially, we were quite worried because um, you might have read in the news there was a lot of fossil fuel lobbyists there. There was actually also a lot of agribusiness lobbyists there, but they didn't get the space that we were worried they would, they would get at these conversations. Um, and there was a lot of food conversations. I think um, there was a record amount of time spent in the first week on the food discussions and the fact that we have now have a new um, separate negotiation track just on agriculture and food systems. It's the only sector that actually has its separate negotiation track in the in the UNFCCC. So it, that in its own is quite remarkable. Um, and like Rashmi said, it has really expanded from just focus on agriculture to broader food security, to aspects of nutrition, to the social determinants of health as well. And uh, also the role of small scale landholders, of indigenous peoples, of women, in, in, in basically feeding the world and in, in ensuring food security. So it has really expanded into a more food systems um, perspective discussion, which is, is, a, is a big win in my mind. Um, and the program will run for another four years now. So it's very, it's, it's, one, it's one to watch, I think. Um, and then lastly, also just on finance, like Shweta said, it's the first time ever that there's a clear link to the need to transform the global financial system. That's never happened before. And that's something that you could say is sort of outside of the, realm of the UNFCCC that they've now brought in just because it's the only way really to address the massive costs that we are facing. Um, and the world has also changed since the COVID pandemic and how we saw that governments were able to just redesign their whole financial system or find money where there was no money before, even with the war in Ukraine now, where suddenly there is a lot of um, a lot of things that governments actually can do uh, fiscally and financially. 
we, we live in a different world now and, and um, vulnerable countries will no longer accept the fact that, oh, there is no money because there clearly is money uh, when we redesign the financial system. And it's it's incredible that that's now made it into this discussion. Um, and I think that will be one to watch as well for next year to see how that will play out. Yeah, um, oh, yep, if I could quickly add a little bit onto what Arthur said about finance and what Shweta said about finance as well. Um, it was one of the main things on the agenda before COP started, how the financial mechanisms were going to play out the 100 billion goalpost um, and how that was going to get renegotiated, what countries were going to bring to the table. This was meant to be the COP to kind of look at that. Um, and I had a really interesting way of um, trying to keep track of discussions because the other thing that um, also played a big role at this year's COP was the uh, presence of big tech um, in that space and how misinformation and disinformation about everything was coming out of COP as well. So I had a little game in my head, um, again, you know, looking at from, you know, it's a classic health sector metaphor, you know, when a health professional is telling a patient's family some kind of terrible news. Um, how they handle it is imperative. And that metaphor is exactly how I kind of followed the, the climate finance discussions um, to discern, you know, what was acceptable and what wasn't. Um, you know, you, we would never in our space accept a health professional coming up to a patient and say things like, you know, what's financially viable when your kid is in the hospital bed dying? Funerals are cheaper. We'd never accept that. And if anything I heard during the COP talks resembled that type of language, I knew that that was going to be a big space to shine a light on or to push back on. We don't accept anything when it's a one-on-one -on -one level of care, when it's our own families, when it's our own community. Um, but on this level, for some reason, we don't apply that. But the situation we're in currently is of that. You know, we have destruction of systems. We have destruction of communities um but i think a lot of the financial conversations were kind of um in lieu of the tone was very much should we could we maybe that'd be nice instead what we should be doing is saying no you would not say this to a parent who's about to lose their child all we want to hear and we want to see is that every single person is doing their job in every single space to make this happen um but finance was uh was definitely a fascinating space that I am trying to be hopeful about. And so I think in leading up to COP28, um, that is definitely something that we are going to have to follow quite closely with um, everything else that happens from here on to COP28 because there wasn't a, an agreement made on it. There isn't renewed investment on that $100 billion space. Um, also, a lot of the countries don't necessarily know how to define climate finance that's the other issue and again these are these are problems that if a health professional were saying that to a parent you wouldn't accept it so i think in that scenario there there is from my side at least a lot of um aggression um but also <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting for the hope i'm fighting for the hope um i really want to thank uh, you all. Uh, I I actually feel a bit a fair bit of hope from that and I definitely don't want to take down the tone too much um, but I think it is important that we you know we've already discussed that uh, it didn't get us closer to 1.5 degrees um, and it's important to talk about that to know the problem so that we can keep working forward to fix it. Um, Obviously, uh, Arthur and Rashmi were in Egypt and, and Shweta is uh, based in India. Uh, just, I, it might've been the same way you were, but a lot of the media commentary was around the influence of fossil fuel lobbyists um, and this like tussle that happened over the text around fossil fuels. Um, and what we ended up with was the same text that was in Glasgow, which was, uh, I might butcher this a little bit, but like a, a commitment to phase down unabated fossil fuel projects. Um, I will sort of get into your thoughts about that, but I'm wondering if someone can actually define what unabated fossil fuel projects means, because I think it's like this purposely uh, evasive word that actually what is an unabated fossil fuel project? 
I mean, I, not going into the definition of it, but what, what it really means is that we don't mean business anymore. We'll continue to do as much as much bad stuff as long as it makes us money. And it sounds like we are trying to do something good. Sorry, I'm just like, I'm just being really, really harsh on this because okay. um, and, and, and <laughs> I feel in, in that sense, what the, the positives that we just discussed about like uh, COP27 and what it did achieve was looking at more of like the outcomes of the climate crisis, but not really looking at the causes of the climate crisis. And fossil fuels is right front and center, what, what is causing the climate crisis and our inability, given that with science making it so, so clear that we have, we are on the clock over here, we have limited time and we, we, we have a set decisions and actions that we need to take to make sure that we are not off this or on this disaster suicidal or whatever the world leaders say uh, path. And despite all of that information, I mean, I can see it in a positive and negative way. The fact that we have not able to come to consensus that all fossil fuels, and I, I mean, this is where I feel like encouraged by India's position, which has changed quite a bit from Glasgow COP, um, from saying unabated phase down of fossil fuels to say, if you're talking about phase out, then talk about all fossil fuels and not just coal, coal, oil, and gas. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal, the, the transition that has happened from that language to this language and in, India putting forward that language and countries coming in support and despite that, not making it to the final text and uh, uh, is, is, is disheartening to say the least. The fortunate part is we have not, there's been no backsliding from Glasgow uh, agreement, which is good because it was also at risk. And, and, and certain nations did play their role to disrupt and derail the whole process. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, US and EU both uh, were classic, which, which you would not probably read in a lot of media. Um, however, when you're looking at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, my dogs are like, uh, this is the time of the day, but uh, it's a way when you're looking at like fossil fuels and, and what the, the other thing, the, the, the positive side that how I see from civil society perspective, in the last one year, the momentum against fossil fuels has really built up, be it the uh, conversations around fossil fuel treaty or even, you know, leadership of health professionals. And I, this is where I want to recognize the role of health professionals, making those connections between health and fossil fuel. And the, the, the success of that was that there were increased fossil fuel lobbies in these conferences. I think this is the, 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 the fact that there were more people trying harder and spending more money in trying to influence this position was because we are winning and we need to continue to do that. These are long fights. This will take decades. I mean, unfortunately we don't have decades but we have time and we will have to continue to build that. I mean, this is an opportunity not to get disheartened, but I, I take it as feeling encouraged that whatever I'm doing and whatever we as a community uh, we are doing is working and we need to make it work better. Um, that's awesome. I completely agree with everything Shweta said, um, but just to add to uh, what, you, what you asked, um, Remy. So abated technology refers to carbon capture and storage. So unabated fossil fuels refers to fossil fuels that don't use that. So by saying uh, unabated fossil fuels, it's kind of like saying we can use fossil fuels as long as we, you know, we'll develop this carbon storage technology, blah, blah, blah. So it is a bit of a trap um, in that way. That's kind of where the loophole gets to start created right and I had a I had a lot of fascinating conversations with people a lot of researchers actually who were there um who worked on carbon storage who wanted to find a you know how can we how can we work with fossil fuels you know how can we work with the enemy um and they were like why are we getting so much pushback why is this not a solution and the answer is it's not good enough and it's not going to do enough. It's actually going to lag the entire process down when we already have solutions that work, when renewables are there and they work. And so I think if we lose sight of that narrative and 
start to bend a little bit, we can be in a lot of trouble. And so I think this is a bit of a the wording there, um, yeah, refers to certain technology as a way to work with the fossil fuel industry. Just to that's, yeah, add, no, add that. That's so helpful. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm so sorry because I've fully lost control of the agenda and lost and lost track of how much time I had allotted to each things because the conversation was so interesting. Um, so uh, we will have time for questions. Thanks for everyone for putting them in. So um, I'm going to move us to the last question, um, but anything else um, that you want to add, we can get um, to people um, in, you know, via our social media channels. Um, I wanted to just move to, we've talked a little bit about what was good, what was not so good. Um, COP is sort of the pinnacle of the climate, international climate diplomacy calendar, but there's stuff that happens the entire year after COP and the lead up to the next one. Um, and it's pretty clear, like, we've, we've come a long way, but there's a lot to do. Um, I might throw to each of you quickly uh, about uh, basically what, in your mind is the most urgent thing uh, for us to get done before COP28. Um, and then we'll move to some questions. Um, I might start with you, Arthur. Uh, that's, that's not a small question, Ravi, but in terms of uh, big things happening in the next 12 months, I think the key one is actually happening in a couple of weeks, which is the Biodiversity Summit, which is sort of the, the little sister of the Climate Summit. and just gets way less attention and it's actually a, a really really crucial moment as well because they're trying to create basically the Paris Agreement moment for biodiversity as well and for preserving nature so it would be important for the health community as well to at least keep an eye on what's happening there in the next couple of weeks um, and I think just to echo what Shweta said in terms of the next 12 months I think we will see a massive shift away from uh, fossil fuels and it's very likely fossil fuels will be peaking um, this year, I think the IEA just put out a few new projections as well. So they are feeling the heat and I think we should keep on uh, pushing the heat. And in Australian context, I think there's a lot uh, for us to do to make sure that the government is less hypocritical about speaking the big talk at these COPs, but then still being the third biggest fossil fuel exporter in the world. So there's a lot of things that we can be doing in Australia to keep that pressure on. Uh, Shweta? I'm 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 going to look a little uh, in a different direction. I'm not looking at those big moments that are on the calendar, but I think the lesson for me from this COP and the previous COPs and the coming together of the health community and becoming an important influential voice at these negotiations or outside would be to continue what we are doing, continue and do it like stronger, smarter. Um, I think one message that I definitely see from this COP and, and what I alluded to earlier, referred to earlier about the global north and the global south, the divide, uh, when it comes to the policymakers and the politicians, the divide is very real and 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 the, it plays out in different ways in terms of politics. I mean, what we saw in those two weeks of US and EU kind of watering down certain languages, derailing certain conversations, removing the word, I mean, attempts to remove the word equity from the whole uh, process were, were, were very serious and, 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 and we cannot just let it slide or we cannot just disregard this and continue what we're doing. So I think what is needed in addition to these processes, which are super important and we need to be there, is um, building our own solidarity network and lending solidarity and lending support to communities, to, to groups um, across the globe. Um, and especially marginalized and impacted communities who are at the forefront uh, dealing with this crisis, including the health professionals. And that's where I think health professionals' voices become very, very critical, very important, because they can, I mean, they can communicate to the, their patients, the general community, and they can also advise the policymakers with the right decisions. So we need to continue doing that. And in just in terms of a practical um, outcome or a lesson that gets reinforced every year, the crisis is getting bigger and worse, and the impacts are getting far more real and at scales that sometimes we will not be able to, most of the times we are not able to handle. And the importance of resilient, low carbon healthcare and health systems becomes even more sharper and stronger and more meaningful at this point. One way that health community can really contribute in, in supporting general 
uh, folks and public and everybody else is by making efforts to build climate resilient low carbon health systems that are there when everything else kind of falls apart. And I think that is one thing that I seriously feel, I mean, I feel more, more convinced that we need to be putting, and, and, and sometimes I get frustrated, why are we not talking much about it, right? And, and, and everybody needs to demand this. As a health community, we need to be leading this work and the policymakers need to support this. Thank you, Shwara. Rashmi? Um, yes, I think for me personally, and in what I do and with the people I work with, um, the focus really shouldn't move away from human rights. Um, while all these uh, technical discussions are taking place and, uh, you know, we, we didn't really touch on um, Article 6 during this conversation, but that's another big thing that happened at COP as well. You know, the, we, we tend to zone in in a particular detail, but I think upholding certain things that we might sometimes take for granted because we think it's a given are uh, slowly getting ebbed away at. And as Shweta mentioned, the word equity, that was a big fight. Uh, but I think human rights in general um, is something that it's more important than ever before to uphold. Um, and health is a great um, advocate for that and always has been. And so I think if we continue working in lieu of that, um, yeah, we can we can kind of move forward in the right way in the way we all hope to. Sorry, I was just posting a little bit of information for anyone who's keen about Article 6. Uh, there's so much that happens at these COPs, it's literally impossible to cover it all, but um, really appreciate um, our attempts. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to move to some questions now. Um, we've, I'm just going to do this for about eight, uh, six minutes. So uh, sorry, we're not going to get to all of the questions, but um, Kaha tries to answer them on their Twitter after healthy conversations because we never get to them all. So um, a plug to follow uh, Kaha's Twitter account if you want to get uh, some of the answers as well. Um, actually, Ben, if I could get you to pop a, uh, a link to Kaha's Twitter in the chat, that would be great. Um, I think we've we've sort of touched on this, but I but given uh, how big picture COP twenty seven is and how focused we are all on health, um, Shwet has actually given a couple of good examples now. But I might just open it up to some others. What are the practical implications for health organisations and health professionals in Australia? Um, what are some examples of things that? they should take away from this. Um, one is that we have a powerful voice and we need to use it. Um, are there any others anyone on the panel would like to share? Feel free to just jump in. Maybe um, just to plug uh, that. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Rashmi. Go, go ahead, Arthur. No, go ahead. <laughs> just, just in an Australian context, I think it is also an exciting time because we, um, the government has agreed to develop a national strategy on climate and health. And it's just, I think it is, the key thing that will be happening in the next six months or so. Um, I think it's very important that as health professionals, health organizations, we are very involved in the design uh, of that. I know Kaha is very involved and we will make sure that um, we involve as many people as we can in designing that national strategy. So I think that is really the, the key thing coming out of COP is keeping up that pressure and helping them um, turn those big words into actual ambition. So watch this space. Rashmi? Um, yeah, completely echo uh, what Arthur said just then. Um, but also, I'd I'd like to add um, that I think health professionals and the health sector in general um, plays a really pivotal role in in pushing for the fact that we want things to be evidence based. The way in which we talk about, you know, this is the research. This is what we know. This is other sectors that would benefit from this research. How can we make those intersectoral linkages? Um, we have a really powerful space in which we can push for that. I think um, I always find it quite devastating <laughs> when I go to COP um, and I see um, a lot of the researchers that I work with uh, notice the gap in that way of thinking and all of a sudden everything is political. But it shouldn't be. I think we have a really powerful space in which we can bridge that into, you know, here's what we know. This is as much evidence as we've already got we can make decisions based on this evidence um let's not twist it 
and make it into political agendas. Let's push for this way of thinking. Um, I think right now it's a it's a really pivotal way, and I think definitely we'll see that in Australia. Um, and it, it's moving in a positive direction. I think this government is much more engaged than a lot of the previous ones we've had, which is very positive. Um, but yeah, I think we I think the health professionals really have a spot to play, regardless of whether they work um, at the forefront or in policy or in government. I think the full spectrum kind of needs to come together. Just to add to what Rashmi and Arthur said, as an as a person from outside, always uh, looking. I mean, Australia and health professionals in Australia have somehow, in the in in a very good way, showed us what are the possibilities of. Uh, engagement around climate and health. I mean, the outcomes of the election itself and the mobilization around that is a great example of um, how how health uh, voices and health leadership is kind of shaping the 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 future. I think um, one thing to add would be we need more uh, health leadership to demystify information knowledge and make it more um, accessible to people make it more accessible to policymakers because sometimes we just like, we get caught speaking to our own community more. I think we need to speak out again. And as I said, uh, Australia is a great example of it. And, and, and we continue this tradition, we continue this and we, we build a global sort of a leadership because um, we are no, I mean, what happens in Pakistan doesn't stay in Pakistan. What what happens in one part of the world will not stay. It's a shared, it's our shared environment and health fate. And health is a, a great way of bringing people together, communities together, because it's a shared concern. And uh, so I, I really look up to what's happening in Australia and among the health community to show us to the rest of the world what are the possibilities. Thanks, Shwada. Um, that's a really good point around uh, health professionals finding their point. And uh, I just thought I would give a little plug for a Kaha training next week. Uh, there's Media Training 101 for health professionals on how to talk about climate change. I will put the link in the follow-up email. So um, if you want to have a voice but you don't feel confident uh, in using it, this is a really good way to start. Um, and also I couldn't miss the opportunity to plug another one of um, CAHA's programs for uh, low carbon and resilient healthcare, uh, which is, as Shweta said, so important um, when, you know, when these disasters come along, that our health system is resilient and able to, to be there to help people when they need it most. So um, any health service or hospital is welcome to join the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network, which Kaha coordinates in the Pacific region across um, Australia and New Zealand. I put a link in the chat. There's plenty of information there. Um, it's free to join um, and it's a really good way to be connected into a, a global, a massive network of um, health and uh, health services and hospitals that are doing that work um, and to work out how your organisation can, can be part of the solution. Um, I said we do two questions. We did one. I'm really sorry, um, but I want you all to get away and, and get back to your lives on time. We will send around a recording. Feel free um, to pass it along. Massive thank you to our three speakers. I like honestly feel just lucky to have a conversation I would love to have, have with you anyway um, in front of 50 of our closest friends. So um, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. This is our final healthy conversation for the year. Um, I wish everyone a really, uh, hopefully you get a bit of a break, really well deserved. And uh, we'll see you back again next year for some, some hot new topics. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks everyone. And get well soon, Arthur. <laughs> yes. Thanks everyone.